Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to be here. We just ask, Lord, that uh, I might uh, have my nerves start to calm. Pray, Lord, that your message would be given and pray that the, uh, uh, the audience be able to uh, hopefully get something from it today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Yeah, he asked me a month ago, I think, to preach, and uh, I kept, uh, well, actually, at work, I've been putting in a lot of un, uh, uh, unauthorized hours, I would say. I go in early and stay uh, and start, and I come home and I'm pretty tired, and I just sit there and kind of look off into space. It feels kind of good. Anybody know how that feels? Yeah. So my studying hadn't uh, really come down to this week, and I kept thinking, what am I gonna, what am I gonna speak on? And uh, started on John chapter 14. I love that passage of scripture, and uh, that didn't develop. And I thought of uh, uh, a couple of others, and I ended up in First Corinthians chapter 15, and. Uh, Started out with several titles for this sermon too. One of them was Celebrate. One of them was Celebrate Sunday. One of them was the Gospel. That's where the body will go. But the uh, the title of the sermon is The Resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do you believe? And we'll start. And uh, uh, I'll start with my introduction. And and I'm going to probably read most a uh, lot of it. And I may have said some of this. May have said it identically to what. Uh, the last time I was here, but I want to get started with this because when I think of Jesus Christ, I just don't think of his resurrection. I think every aspect of his life is important. Amen. And uh, so, that, like I said, I may have said this, and uh, when we speak of Jesus, we cannot just speak of one area of his life. His virgin birth begins his journey. Matthew 1 18 24. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Through scripture we see a sinless life. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. John 19.16-18 tells us of his death. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. All four of the Gospels have a resurrection account. Let us look at what Luke had to say. Luke 24, 1 through 3 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. There they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Some would stop right there and say, that is enough. He died. But we don't stop there. Our Christian faith is built on the resurrection. It says, and uh, there are other facts today that we're going to look at. And our, like I said, our text is 1 Corinthians 15. And the first point is the gospel declared. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. It's, uh, we know he is talking to a particular body, the body at Cor Corinth. The scriptures have been passed on to us, so this is speaking to us just as well. He calls them brethren. He refers to them as saved. He states that he is declaring to them the gospel. And I, I liked to look up words. Uh, you can go to a lot of translations, and probably some of the translations have exactly what I'm going to say. 
but I, I'm from the old school, I still like looking up words. And uh, uh, he says, um, I looked up the word declare in the Webster's New International Dictionary Special Edition. The definition is to make clear, to free from obscurity, to set forth at length or in detail, to make known explicitly by language, to communicate clearly to others, whether by acts, words, writings, or signs, to announce, to proclaim. It is like Paul was saying here, hey, pay attention. I don't want you to miss this. If he had been delivering this in person, we would have felt his intensity. I think he, I think he wanted this message to get across, and I don't think he wanted anybody to, to miss it. He wanted it, what he was to say to be clear. He wanted it free of any confusion. He went to great lengths to make it understandable. He communicated clearly to them the gospel. He wanted them to have confidence in what they believed. Chapter 15 gives us a defense to live our lives every day knowing Jesus is alive. Romans 10 says, So faith come in by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I try to use as much scripture as I possibly can and cram it in there because what I have to say really doesn't, really doesn't matter. What scripture does, Amen. does. The gospel, in verse 3 and through 8 it says, we see the gospel defined are described. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also uh, received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains in this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as a born one, uh, born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preached, and so ye believe. Here in a simple declaration, he tells us what the gospel is, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and he, was ro and he rose again, which is, brings us to the third point. The gospel defended, and we see a progression here. And this is the longest point, and hopefully if it gets a little too long, it looks like it may not get long enough, uh, we may be out of here early, or we may not be. So, Two times in this passage he states, according to the scriptures, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and that he rose again according to the scripture. We know the Bible is our best defense, comparing scripture to scripture letting the scripture do the talking and our hands doing the walking. And with that, we'll turn to, uh, let's start with Psalm 1610. We're talking here on the, on the resurrection. Um, Psalm 1610 says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy ones to see corruption. In Isaiah 53 We're going to read all, all 12 verses. I was going to shorten it. But uh, this is a very, uh, uh, very uh, detailed passage of what Christ went through. He says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom, whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and he rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, 
yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Sorry, excuse me here. Let me step back up. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He, brought, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul and an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I get, divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he went under, was numbered with the transgressors, and he bared the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Scripture, there's many other scriptures that we could have looked at, but these two I, I find uh, have a lot of power to them. They, uh, uh, they speak to me. I hope they have spoke to you. Um, Then we see the, the progression continues in this chapter with, uh, with uh, what, he, he, uh, what he has defined as the gospel. And in the progression continues, he says he was seen of Peter, then of the twelve, seen of about 500 brethren at once, some who were alive and some who had died. I like the way Paul words this, some who are falling asleep. And we'll see why we like to sleep a little bit later or more or so and later on. All believers will wake one day. That is our hope. He was seen of James and then of all the apostles, and last of all me as one born out of these times. Paul realized that he was the least of the apostles because he states I persecuted the church of God. He declared the gospel because the grace of God was bestowed on, on him. Verse 11 jumps out at me. First, I want to go back to uh, a, uh, Paul saying he was an apostle. Now, we could sit here and we could just debate whether Paul was an apostle. And uh, uh, the apostleship was that he had had to see Jesus uh, in his ministry. And uh, I, can, I think that Paul could have been there at the Sanhedrin Council when uh, Jesus was, uh, was crucified. Don't know that, but I don't know that either. But I do know that somewhere in the time, and when, on his day of conversion, he may have physically seen the Lord uh, face to face. So uh, I'm not going to argue his apostleship. He says he's an apostle. It's not like today when a, somebody stands up and says, I'm an apostle. Uh, that always causes me to... Uh, Stop, look, and listen. And usually I don't listen very long. So, uh, Find out where I'm at here. Verse 11 jumps out at me. It says, Therefore whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Paul in Galatians has some interesting things to say that I believe will go along with this. Chapter 1, verse 8 says, that Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be cursed. In verse 9, he repeats that Paul takes this gospel message very seriously. He does not want it to be perverted. 
in verse 11, but I certify you, brethren, in, in, uh, in Galatians, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after men, or after man, but for none. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word certify means to make certain of a fact, to verify, to testify in writing. Paul's testimony is different from ours in that we have written word in front of us to check out what we hear. If some preacher or layman tells you that you have received a new revelation, run. Don't pay any attention to them. The scriptures is our final authority. If we take everybody's word, we're going to be really confused people. And you don't even have to go very far to find that. If you'll just go to even your own, uh, some of our own uh, 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 Baptist websites, you can read them and you come away confused. And you just kind of got to walk away and, and uh, go back, check on them every once in a while. Once, sometimes you find a word and sometimes it's just best to stay away. Uh, I like the way that Paul has used the word declare, and then in Galatians he words the uh, uh, word certify. And you remember when you get an old title and you take it down, used to you would have to get it notarized. This is kind of what I have to see with Paul giving out his word. He says, "I'm telling you, this is facts, and uh, uh, it's it's the truth. This 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 is accurate." When you got that paper back from the state. That says that the car that you have is yours. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, it didn't. Uh, if you had the wrong VIN number on it, and they found that out, uh, uh, you'd be paying a big fine. The other part is: is don't get in a debate with the people who you are opposed to, or that have a false sto- uh, uh, false message. Most of what they want to argue about is not worth it. Titus 3, 9 through 11, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic, which means a divisive man, and after the first and second admon- admonition reject, knowing that he is such is perverted and sins being condemned of himself. And being condemned of himself. I have a gentleman at work that loves to argue. I mean, he lives to argue. I mean, you cannot be around him within 10 minutes that you're not trying, he's not trying to get you in an argument. I've had two in the last month with him, and finally I've just told him to leave. And uh, I said, I'm not arguing with you. I said, We're through discussing it. You know what he told me? He says, You're rude. <laughs> he says, you have to have the final word. I said, no. I said, I just don't want to argue with you. And it's everything from, uh, well, he's used to be, say, he's a Christian. Now he says he went to an agnostic. Now he says he's an atheist. We were having a discussion. We got off on gun control and uh, our gun, uh, conceal and carry. He started off running off onto gun control and we needed more of it and uh, I would disagree with him. And, uh, and I said, as long as men are evil, and I said, a man is evil, uh, uh, I said, we will always have people who will take guns and go out and shoot people. And, uh, and uh, he didn't like me saying that everybody was evil. And uh, he, says, he says, you really believe that? And I said, yes, I do. And uh, he wanted to argue that. So... I shut him off, and uh, uh, that may not be the best way to do it, but I don't know how, I, how to uh, talk to a person that just wants to keep continuing arguing. Sometimes we just hear things that just don't bring true with what we know from the scriptures, and they sucker punch us and knock the spiritual air right out of us. Have you ever had that happen when you're talking to someone and they... They come up with an idea that's completely foreign to anything that you've ever heard. Uh, The cults are good at it. And uh, 
I won't go into naming cults, but uh, I have a couple in my mind that, uh, well, the one, they, uh, one that they teach that Jesus was a son of God and not the son of God. And uh, uh, I believe he was the son of God. We get so busy in our daily lives that we don't spend time in the Word of God. Anybody find that happening? We are so exhausted we, want, we don't want to take time to build up our defenses. Here's what one preacher had to say. He said, when I left the ministry to due to my skepticism, one of the factors involved in my departure concerning the reliability of the New Testament documents and the resurrection of Jesus was the folks from the Jesus Seminar had me second-guessing whether I could trust what the New Testament said and if I could truly accept the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Has anyone here heard of the Jesus Seminar? It was a group of scholars from across the United States and maybe across the world, but at least across the United States. One of them, Professor, uh, if you said not hardly, uh, MSU, and he was on that seminar. And... Uh, they deny about everything about Jesus Christ, and uh, especially his literally body of resurrection. He went on to say he entered a Lifeway Christian bookstore and found three books that changed his life more than any other book outside the Bible. He read Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ, Josh McDowell's book The New Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and Josh McDowell's book A Ready Defense. This is what I'll say about reading books. The books that we read need to be selected carefully. We need to find dependable authors that we trust to rightly divide the truth and then compare to it with scripture and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us to that truth. I know that when you all were looking for a pastor after uh, talking to Josh one time that you all listened to Adrian Rogers. Uh, tapes on from Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers is a uh, would be a good source. There wouldn't be any uh, anything that he... I would still listen, and I would still check it out, but uh, I, he would be one of my first people I would, would like to go to. I, I haven't got to uh, read his... Uh, listen to his sermons like I uh, would like to. Uh, excuse me, here's just a second. Verse 12 through 23 gives us the second part of our defense. Studying from two different Bibles, this passage of Scripture had two different titles for these divisions of this passage. One of them was the risen Christ, our hope. The other, the absolute necessity of Christ's resurrection. And both are correct. And I just, I put it like this. The ab absolute of Christ's resurrection is our hope. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Some in the church, in verse 12, let me get there. It helps to be in the right text. Some in the church were saying that there is no resurrection of dead. We would be surprised how many in our in the church today is spreading that line. We expect the, from the lost world, or maybe a more political correct work term would be the unchurched. Not much difference, but uh, uh, we are so politically correct. We try to use words that uh, doesn't offend anyone, and uh, the lost is an offensive word to a lot of people. Yeah. That is why we need to keep our guard up, search the scriptures, be, be around like-minded people. But unto us which are saved, the resurrection is the power of God. Verse 13, it says, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Everything we believe just falls apart. Verse 14, the preaching is vain. Vain meaning empty, devoid of any really value, worth, or meaning. Useless, worthless. 
It says your faith is useless, worthless. It just keeps getting worse in these pa this passage. Verse 10, 15, we are found false witnesses because we have testified that God raised up Christ from the dead. It repeats that our faith is in vain and then adds, but we are yet in our sins. I don't know about you, but that weight would be awful heavy to bear. Of course, now if you were lost and didn't believe the word of God, uh, even the Bible tells us that nature or the natural world uh, tells us of uh, consequences. But um, if this is the case, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And I want to tell you, I, I look forward to seeing the, my uh, saved loved ones when I reach the other side. When I pass from this life into the next one, when the rapture happens. Uh, let's let the weight of those two verses sink in. We are yet in our sins, and they have perished. Every we everything we believe is gone. It's wiped out. Verse 19 puts it this way. And in this life, only we have hope in Christ. We are men most miserable. Adrian Rogers has this to say about the resurrection. The resurrection is not merely important to the historic faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. It is a single, the singular doctrine that elevates Christianity, Christianity above all other world religions. Billy Graham sums up it in one sentence. The entire plan for the future has its key in the resurrection. The final point is the gospel defeats, and that's our future. There are a lot of verses between verse 23 and 30, 50, and uh, I'm not going to try to hit that part. I'm going to go back someday and fill that in, because if I ever teach this somewhere, it may be two or three lessons instead of one, if I can make them last that long. <laughs> so... Um, let us read verse 20 and 23 and use them as to leap and leap forward. But Christ, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they are Christ at his coming. Now, Verse 50 through 58, I'm not going to read them. I'm going to just go through them as, uh, as I go. Uh, verse 50 says, now this I say. And it's, uh, he says, now, the, uh, now this I say. He says, it's like when the preacher, this is what I think, when the, when the preacher says, this is my final point, And then says, oh, one more thing. And how many preachers have you heard say one more thing? several times. So I'm going to try not to do that today. This section, this section is a great conclusion. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51, he tells us that he is going to show us a mystery. One day it is going to happen. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, this, I don't know if you like to read, but I like to read Westerns. So I do read a few mysteries, but I like Westerns over mysteries. Uh, my dad was a cowboy from way back. Uh, he'd be 111 this year. And uh, so he had some, some stories to tell me about living through before the Depression and through some pretty rough, rough, rough times. And, uh, but a good mystery... And this is a mystery. It says, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. And the way I picture this in my mind is we ought to be on the edge of our seat in anticipation. This part of the chapter should begin and is ready for the ending. The trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Did you notice the word shall? doesn't say maybe. Or this may be, or that this may be a possibility, it shall happen. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. 
Must is another positive word there. The power word shall have put on incorruption, shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture, uh, we could sit here and we could debate on that one. Whether you be a post-millennial, pre-trib, post, uh, post-trib, I believe in a literal one day coming of the rapture. I believe it's going to be before the tribulation period. It's what I've been taught. It uh, doesn't. It, in my little mindset, it can't make any. It doesn't make any sense because he says it's going to come, and it's going to come as a thief in the night in another passage of scripture. But it's going to come. If we're in the tribulation period, it's not going to. It's not going to be rocket sciences to figure out that, that he's coming. Yeah, when he's coming, he's coming. And he's coming soon. It could be he's been plant. Uh, it's been expected for 2,000 years, and we need to be looking for him. But all, everything that we believe, the facts is that we've got more things coming. And all of it, all of it is about whether the resurrection is true or not. Robert Lowry, does anyone know what, uh, what song that he's famous for? Baptist preacher. He wrote Nothing in the Blood. And I just happened to uh, find another song, and this morning I was looking through the hymnal here, and he wrote this one. And the two together, could, you could almost put them, insert them in here, and they could almost tell this, this passage of Scripture. It's one of my favorite ones. Low in the grave, he laid Jesus my Savior. Waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Vainly they watch his bed. Remember, they watched his, the grave. They even sealed it. They put a big rock in front of it. They put a, Romans put a seal on it. Death cannot keep his prey. He tore the bars away, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He rose a victor from the dark domain. He lives forever with his saints to array. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. The last verse. Then gives us some uh, things that we need to do. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. The conclusion, one of the titles of the sermon was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do you believe? Brothers and sisters, are you convinced to be steadfast, unmovable? Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know your labor is not in vain. Your work is not empty. It is not useless or worthless. It has value. It has worth. It has meaning. It has been said that in the early church, when one Christian would greet another, he would say, He is risen. The other would respond, He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this today. Pray, Father, that uh, these folks would be excited about, uh, about the resurrection, not just of Jesus Christ, but the hope that we have. Lord, we, one of these days we will die. And if there is no hope, we are all people most miserable. Thank you for this time to be able to speak. Pray, Lord, that you would just use it to whatever... Uh, you want to accomplish in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for that.